I know that you have heard about big privacy breach settlements and you worry that you could be next. Are you a healthcare provider who needs to hire information technology or business support services, but don't know what questions to ask? Are you a vendor who works with healthcare or dental practices and need to better understand your responsibilities to keep your clients regulation compliant and your business disaster free? My name is Jean Eaton, your practice management mentor with Information Managers and your host for this practice management nuggets for your healthcare practice episode. Today, my guest, Donna Grindle, will share her observations on the HIPAA violation trends from the United States so that healthcare providers and vendors in Canada can prevent similar experiences. Today, we're <laughs> talking about what healthcare practices should know about vendor vetting and accountability. Welcome, Donna. Thank you for joining me. Oh, well, you're very welcome. For, I am thrilled to be here. Well, I, I need to admit that I am a t-shirt wearing member of the <laughs> Donna Grindle and David Sims fan club. Oh, he's going to be so excited you included him. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I never miss an episode of your Help Me With HIPAA podcast. And I love your tagline that HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. How did mm. you come up with that? I have to admit, David said, hey, what do you think about this tagline? And I said, hey, that sounds great. It, that it was did. it. <laughs> That's but it. so we we our whole podcast started because he and I kept having these conversations and he kept telling me we should record these and publish them. So we did. And, and that's it. And you've been doing it since May of 2015. Yeah. Yeah. So we're about to hit our five year anniversary. That's such an amazing thing. <laughs> I know. Every <laughs> single week we have published something. We've never missed a Friday. Even one time I was really, really sick and I was barely able to function. We had to get one out and we did a live one and, uh, and just record, you know, just blasted it out there and recorded it. And, uh, uh we never were asked to do another one. So I'm pretty sure that'll be the only one. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, doing 237 published podcasts so far, uh, that's, uh, that's amazing accomplishment and a commitment for, from both you and, Don, and David. Well, thank you. We, we feel proud of it and, uh, we do really believe in what we're doing. I mean, our whole objective is uh you know to educate we think it's very very important to educate as many people as possible about the importance of privacy and uh, cyber security in today's world it, incredibly important um so i just want to let uh, do a proper introduction for you donna <laughs> um so donna grindle is the founder and ceo of cardon in georgia the united states and cardon is a hipaa focused business so Donna brings over 30 years experience in healthcare IT, which is the solid foundation of Cardon's HIPAA privacy and security consulting business. Donna stays busy with speaking engagements, the weekly Help Me With HIPAA podcast, and managing a business with a growing client list. Donna's sense of humor and Southern charm spills out in everything she does. Yeah, that sounds really marketing fluff. <laughs> but it <laughs> but sounds it's like me. true. <laughs> it is me. It is you. And your partner with Help Me With HIPAA is David Sims, who's the managing partner with Security First IT in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So he helps to bring, well, I guess you both come from an IT um, roots. Yeah, I, I was still running my own MSP when we met and I started doing training classes uh, four MSPs to learn HIPAA and I did the very first one and he signed up and that's it, it went downhill from there <laughs> <laughs> well it sounds like you have a great partnership yes it is it's it's a great joint venture and we do enjoy it and we constantly come up with new things to do uh, and and ways that we can uh, build on what we've got there. So we appreciate ourselves enough to not overdo it, but at the same time, respect that we have uh, built a great listener base and folks like you. We we really do appreciate that. You know, tuning in every uh, week that so many people do. Yeah. 
And it's very interesting that, you know, five years later, we still have more things to talk about. <laughs> Are you when ever I started, at a loss of, what to, of things to talk about for topics? Yeah, when we started this, somebody said, how are you going to figure out what to talk about every week? And I was like, I just read the news, and there's going to be something in there. And literally, most of the time, it's either what we've gotten multiple phone calls about in our, in our, our business or – what's in the news or what's changing soon and you need to be ready. Yeah. Um, there, there never seems to be a lack of examples about the bad things that are happening. And mm -hmm. it surprises me, although I suppose it shouldn't anymore that when I go out and do training, I get people asking me questions about the very fundamental things. And I realize, you know, not everybody's heard this message yet. We still need to talk about the basics. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's, you know, that I always tell people it's, it's like one of the uh, marketing rules uh, that somebody taught me a long time ago. Cause I was complaining about some ad where the jingle was annoying, but I couldn't get it out of my head and we've all had those, you know, and they said, that means the marketing's working because when you hear it so often, you're sick of it, then you know, the message. Or when it's, yes, well, we don't have, you know, so many people get jaded by, oh, yet another of my information is never going to, because it's just data breach after data breach. It doesn't count. It doesn't matter anymore. And I'm like, you don't get it. There's so much more to it. Yeah. And, uh, it yeah. and it is. It, it's getting worse, not better. Well, it, it certainly is many sections of information and the volume of information, but even just that little stuff that happens in, in practices on a day-by-day -day basis, that fax that goes to the wrong place, that patient that uh, has their lab or x-ray results handed to them and they find out it's the wrong one, every little breach is important about the person that the information's about. Oh, absolutely. And it's questions that we answer constantly. You mean I need to worry about that? Well, yeah. And and it, we're talking people that have been in healthcare for a very long time, and they will tell you they understand what they're supposed to do, but they don't understand at the very fine details like the cases you just mentioned. Yeah. So, Donna, what is your number one tip for healthcare providers when working with vendors who have access to PHI? I'd say the number one tip is don't assume that you don't have to ask questions that, uh, if, if you're not, uh, you know, we say, if you're not looking troubles are cooking and that assumption that I've known somebody forever, uh, you know, they're not going to do this and those kind of things. It, you know, that it's, again, it gets back to the relationship. If, if you have a good relationship and you have a good vendor, you should be able to sit down and say, let's review this. Let's talk about this, have that conversation and have it regularly. You are listening to practice management nuggets, podcasts, tips to help you start, grow and improve your healthcare practice and your career. I help you manage the pink elephant in the room. Get the show notes from our website at practicemanagementnuggets.live. I think that healthcare and healthcare privacy and regulations between Canada and the United States are probably a lot more similar than they are different. Um, so I wanted to talk about how, how we are similar and how we are different. Um, so let's take a look at just a couple of definitions just so that we can have a conversation about um, the privacy breaches and what vendors and healthcare providers need to know so that uh, everyone understands what we're talking about. So in the US, Donna, do you wanna walk us through just a few, a few key terms to help us understand the rest of the conversation? Sure. Um, well, we have HIPAA and that's what everybody talks about. And always remember it's spelled H-I-P, a, A, there's no PP in HIPAA. Just remember that one. Uh, we, we really struggle with people that uh, will write us notes and tell us how they understand HIPAA. 
uh, really well. Uh, but it was uh, passed in 96. It didn't come into effect in the United States until 2003 was the privacy section of it. And then 2005 was the security section of it. And then we had part of the stimulus bill in, you know, when the economy tanked and we dumped a bunch of money in, everybody was having to do that around the world. Um, they added high tech, which updated HIPAA and added what we call the breach notification uh, rule. So we got the privacy rule, security rule, breach notification rule, all parts of the HIPAA that was then uh, updated um, with high tech. And then we have the um, law. Those are laws, and those laws are managed by the Department of Health and Human Services, which is a cabinet department at the federal level, and their Office for Civil Rights uh, within HHS, and there's also an Office for Civil Rights within the Department of Education, so sometimes that gets confused, but Everything that has to do with healthcare and human services, the Office for Civil Rights under HHS is responsible for, and privacy is a civil right. And then uh, it applies to what is known as a covered entity, and the covered entity is, you know, a physician's office, uh, an insurance company, or the clearinghouse that manages the exchange of information between them. So you got the provider of care the insurance company and that that's our biggest difference is the control the insurance companies have around uh health they're the big chunk and then there are clearing houses that facilitate the communications of payments and claims between the two those are covered entities and then any business that provides a service to those entities that requires them to have access to what we call protected health information is then considered a business associate and they are separate and equally liable now to protecting that patient information under original HIPAA. They weren't. And under high tech, those changes, it made them separate and equally liable. And it also added enforcement under high tech. And I needed to point that out because that's the most important thing that made people move is enforcement, which we had voluntary compliance under the original HIPAA, which I always equate that to a speed limit. You know, it's, it's the speed limit to me is just a, a general, general recommendation of how fast you should be going. <laughs> it, it works until you get caught, right? Yeah. Well, you know, we always joke about it that, that uh, there's a stretch of it, you, we talked earlier, you've been to Savannah, Georgia, and you, well, you likely flew in to Savannah, but to drive from uh, uh, any other part of Georgia to Savannah, there's this big, long stretch of highway. And there's nothing on it. I mean, nothing. And so people generally will run really fast down through there unless there's a police officer. I mean, it's like, it's that same thing that you're talking about. Exactly. Uh, you know, if there are no police on the road, what does the speed limit mean? It just means what you should be going if you see a police officer. So there you go. Right, right. And that's the extent of it. Okay. <clears throat> so the Canada legislation kind of create, generated a, a little bit differently. Um, so in Canada, each province and territory um, has their own specific health legislation. Um, now, not all provinces and territories have specific health legislation, but they do have business privacy legislation. So there's a whole variety of acronyms. Um, uh, so each of the provinces have their own legislation. And of course, with their own legislation, they have their own definitions. Uh. Um, so sometimes um, the healthcare providers are considered custodians or trustees, and they nearly always include physicians, but other healthcare providers of other professional regulations um, also fall into health privacy legislation in some provinces, but not in others. So in Ooh. Alberta, it includes physicians and dentists and chiropractors and uh, dental mechanics and dental hygiene and midwives and podiatrists and a variety of other folks. And in other provinces, it's pretty much just physicians. So there are a lot of variety there. But those physicians and healthcare providers certainly work with vendors who support them. And whether or not we call them um, an affiliate or an information manager or a responsible affiliate, 
the definitions change from province to province, but for the purposes of our conversation today, we're going to call them a vendor or a BAA um, to use your, your U.S. legislation. Mm -hmm. Each of the provinces have different legislation. Um, Alberta started in 2001. We were one of the first provinces with uh, health-specific legislation. But just recently, in the last couple of years, are the provinces implementing mandatory privacy breach notification. Mm -hmm. And just recently are some of the provinces actually having mandatory minimum fines in the event of a privacy breach. So the legislation across Canada is very different. Um, but today what we want to talk about is, you know, regardless whether or not it's regulated by legislation, these are best practices about what you want to have in place between your vendors and your healthcare providers. So you are compliant with legislation of today and hopefully for tomorrow, but more importantly, you're protecting your patients and you're protecting your business. Mm. It's absolutely the same thing, but very different. Yeah. The devil's in the details, right? Exactly. Well, we have 50 different privacy laws now and roughly the same number of a data breach notification and everybody here is complaining that there's not a standardization at the federal level and you know california with their new ccpa is freaking everybody out uh to some extent um so i can't comprehend uh managing health care most of these state laws uh exclude health care not, not not all of them some of them uh, have their own thing, but the vast majority of them say, okay, if you're covered by HIPAA uh, and you're in healthcare, now a business associate, not the same, but uh, the covered entities, they can kind of slip to the side of those laws. But you, you know, mm -mm. having, uh, if you, if you live on the, the line between provinces, if you step across the line back and forth, you get to play a game on what you call people. You know, have your meetings there on one of the buildings that crosses it and say, okay, everybody in this side of the room is this and everybody on this side is that. That would drive yeah. me nuts. So good for you. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Um, but, you know, we talked about um, the, the legislation being that, that baseline standard. So, yeah. you know, we need to meet that baseline standard, but we really want to do better than that. Exactly. Right. And that's what we say HIPAA is. And we did an episode recently, as you know, that HIPAA is the floor. And we got that term that, that triggered us making that episode was from the director of OCR, the Office for Civil Rights. So the head of the HIPAA police is saying HIPAA is the bare minimum, trying to get people to understand that. And when somebody asked him, hey, you know, the security rule hasn't changed since 2005. Should we uh, make some updates to it? And he's like, we can't get people to do this. You know, updating it is only going to make it harder to get people to do stuff. So let's get everybody doing this and then talk about updates. So it's absolutely that case. Absolutely. Okay. So let's get into what is this? What is um, the relationship between vendors and the healthcare providers? And what could go wrong when there isn't a proper uh, business associate agreement or a proper working relationship between vendors and, and healthcare providers? Well, first and foremost, we always point out the worst thing you can always do is assume. And, you know, we always pause and say, we know what that means. We know what that means. <laughs> because making the assumption is where everything, you know, the wheels fall off right away. So nowhere along the way can you because, it, you know, frankly, just like HIPAA is not about compliance, it's about patient care. We start with, first and foremost, what we're worried about in this conversation is our patients. We're worried about protecting their well-being and uh, loss of privacy of their data seriously impacts patients. So we always start the conversation that way. And then we say, now, if you have access to this very serious information, um, then we need you to take it as seriously as we do. And unfortunately, those years where HIPAA uh, was uh, voluntary enforcement, you know, voluntary compliance, 
they had to sign those and and many vendors started treating it like just paperwork you know sign here and kind of stuff so we had to re we're still in the process now this is 10 years later from when this changed we're still in the process of revamp revamping the way people look at that because if you don't have that relationship defined clearly essentially every day under hipaa that you don't have a proper business associate agreement in place but you allow people to have access to patient information to prover provide services you have two hipaa breaches every single day one for the lack of having the business associate agreement in place and one for giving the data to somebody that didn't have authorization because they didn't have a baa so when you start with that's what can go wrong is two <laughs> every day um then you take it down the path of if you're not doing that part right we have so many uh settlement agreements that have come out in uh, the last you know five years that the first thing they'll say is show me your business associate agreement and what the responsibilities are to divide that liability so the agreement is the most important piece because it's defining clearly the liability if you don't have that right that's the first thing that can go wrong is liability is all over the board everybody's equally liable but there you don't even have an out to say look they told me they were doing their part yeah exactly um, so you, you you if you're sharing information with the patient's health information or protected health information with another vendor so that they can provide a service for you and you don't have that baa or ima um you're breaking the law you're sharing information yeah. that you can, you don't have the authority to do that with right and you're not getting a commitment from them to protect it yeah you know so the right away you're saying i don't care about my patient data and that you know we, we i always say as a kid i always took the uh the um let's just say i had issues with authority so the lack of disapproval implies approval is all i always say so you've got to make sure that you have that in place because a lot of these vendors even though they sign the agreement I mean, we literally have had people say well you everybody has to sign it you have to sign it to do business in healthcare, but you don't have to do it uh okay do you sign all your contracts that way because it literally says in step one of your business associate agreement i understand i have to follow the law you know exactly and uh, it's it it boggles my mind that people think that this is just a, a paper pushing process and it's not important but you know this makes the foundation of that prenuptial agreement in your in your working relationship work and i love it, it. right <laughs> it's a prenup it's a prenup and you want to make sure that you are engaging the right person so having that bia process really is a great way to be able to vet um, the businesses that you want to work with and you can make that selection about you know do you choose to work with that business mm -hmm. um, if they don't have a BAA or an IMA or understand what it's about then go on to the next vendor yeah we, there are places now that if somebody says can you help us do HIPAA we want to get in the business everybody's like yeah I ain't got time for that you know. it, it's a big stretch um, so mm -hmm. for those vendors who want to work in the healthcare vent uh, space and take the time to learn about the legislation how they can help that healthcare provider make this uh, smooth what the requirements are get those templates for the BIAs and IMAs then to my mind they become the vendor of choice that you want to work with well I, I would with one caveat there uh, if you're just using templates Nah, not in our world anyway and that gets back to the litigious environment that we are in right in in our contracts if you use a template you're screwed <laughs> this is the bottom line <laughs> well, you, you need to start with something you know going to yeah. start with the template and customize it for for the relationship it, well it, it it is at least a prenup it is know. yeah uh but it is a prenup that has the bare minimums in it and that's what we talk about that being the floor right and yes 
uh, if the the problem is you have the vendors that start out and they think that's what they have to do and they start with the template and then they stick with it. They don't go further. So I want somebody that's willing to put the effort in to learn about it, get the framework in place and then they can begin. But I better see, you know, them going the next step and having, uh, you know, coming back and saying, okay, now we got a really good uh, business associate agreement. Let's sit down and review this, make sure we're on the same page. Our service level agreement that defines what we're going to do is also better. There, there should be constant improvement in a program for data privacy and security, period. And particularly, uh, if you don't have those things in place at all, and then you put them in place, but you leave them there. That's not a privacy and security program. That's a paperwork thing still. Right. So, you yes, you can start this. there. I don't have a problem with people starting there. But their next step should be, okay, we've got the basics in place. We're starting to understand what we need to do. But we've got to be on a fast path. And, I, and you look at a two-year scenario. So I take a vendor, and if that's where they are, Within two years, I should see a vastly different approach to data privacy and security. So what have you done for me lately? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, <laughs> right. Um, so having that agreement in place is, is your starting point. You want to have that working relationship with your vendors mm -hmm. so that they are supporting the healthcare um, provider on a regular basis. Now, the, from the vendor perspective, um, you know, you want to be able to pick good clients that you're going to have a good working relationship. Um, so if you were a vendor um, coming from your, from your IT routes and you knew that these were things that uh, your healthcare provider needed to be compliant with, but they weren't interested in putting the effort into it, mm -hmm. um, what suggestions would you have for the vendor? Well, first and foremost, you can't come in there and demand they do it because that it just it doesn't work i mean no one wants to be told how to run their business so the approach that we recommend is that you lay out what you're doing to make sure you're holding up your end of the bargain and you come in and you review it all and the very first thing that you should be asking as an it vendor especially is if they are you know really serious about it they will have a risk management plan that's what you're supposed to have. You know, that any business should have a risk management plan and they should know uh, what should be in there because they've done a security risk analysis properly. So we recommend you, you have your ducks in a row because if you don't have your ducks in a row and you just go in there and tell them they should be doing it, um, you know, hello kettle, <laughs> calling the kettle black. You can't, you can't criticize them until you're ready. And once you do that, then you say, okay, we're prepared. And the way that we can make sure that our things are going to meet your requirements is we need to see your security risk analysis and risk assessments, your risk management plan. And if they don't have that, then, well, under, under our rules, you, you really could take the approach of, you know, some people say, I'm just not going to do, I'm not going to, that's a liability to me. If right. you're not doing your part, because we all know as IT people, the minute something goes wrong and there's a data breach, who's, who's pointing the finger at IT? Every finger is pointed at IT. Um, you know, we, we were just talking, we recorded our podcast earlier today and we were just talking about the Equifax breach. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the CEO of this huge operation with massive amounts of data sits in front of Congress and says one dude was the reason that they had a data breach. That vendor was saying that one person in IT didn't do their job and millions upon millions upon millions of people lose their uh, privacy data or lose, they have a privacy violation. So, when when I'm looking at the vendors and and I'm saying, uh, you know, I expect you to do this, it goes the other way as well. And we're able to say, look, that's too much of a liability to me that you're going to point your finger at me or, um, you know, you're, you're not where you need to be 
and I understand it's a business decision, and we'd be happy to help. We have people that can help you do this the right way. Now, the the thing that really gets into trouble is where the IT vendors say they can do all of HIPAA, and they don't understand there's a privacy piece that that has very specific information and then they'll claim that there's ambiguities in the security rule. There's only ambiguities if you're looking for a checklist. There's no ambiguities. It's figure out what works, define how it's going to work and do it. So I then can offer as the vendor, uh, I'm going to help you do this and I'd be more than happy to do that, but it's your business decision. It's your business. Um, you know, how do you feel about it? Right. And then the third thing, which is happening, and I'm absolutely certain it's happening because, you know, we know people, is that there are IT companies that when they can't get their clients to do what they're supposed to do and they're worried about the liability, they turn them in to uh, OCR. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We haven't seen, you know, because it takes years to resolve those kinds of things, the investigations. But I'm absolutely certain the investigations are uh, taking place. I do, and we may never know the resolutions of them. But you basically always have three choices in any business decision and partnership. I can, uh, you know, take it, you know, as it is and go with it. I can encourage the other side of the coin to, you know, see things the way I do, and let's work on it together. Or I could rat them out <laughs> and not do it, you know. So it's the same thing. It's just presentations, everything, as they say. Yeah, it is. And of course, you've always got the option to, you know, go to the next vendor or the next client. Yeah, um, and that, that's it. You just walk away. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about liability for a moment. So in the event of a, a privacy breach or um, a security breach between an IT vendor or a billing vendor or a transcription vendor and the healthcare provider, um, in the agreements, there needs to be this, this wonderful wording that says about liability. So mm-hmm. if I'm the IT vendor, I know that a lot of the privacy breaches are um, in a healthcare practice are going to happen Um, In the employees of the healthcare practice, they're going to make an oops, they're going to click on a a phishing email, they're going to make a poor decision. Um, So that liability clause would identify that if the healthcare provider is responsible for that that privacy breach, then the healthcare provider needs, is is responsible for the costs and the time and, and the resources associated for managing that privacy breach. If the IT vendor or the billing vendor, the error is on their side. Their systems weren't secured. They, their employees um, used the information inappropriately. They, they stole it. They reused it. Um, then the vendor is responsible for the associated costs about managing that breach. Yeah, and that's where those the template statement came in because the basic BAA templates that are published – do not address indemnification at all. That's not even in there. But yes, that is absolutely the case. And I might add that just because it's in there, you need to read it closely because we've had people send them to us that say, if if the uh, covered entity or the upstream BA, as we call it, um, if they have a data breach, we're responsible. It doesn't say if they have a data breach we caused. It says... If they have a data breach, we're responsible. Now, that's not the intent, but when it gets down to when the rubber meets the road, so to speak, it's going to matter what's in that contract. Yeah. So I always say, look, I don't mind. If it's my fault, it's my fault. And, you know, I'm in this business to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing. But don't leave me in this big gap. And and that liability definition has to be more clear than it is in most of the templates. I agree. So it also needs to address that communication. Um, who's going to inform whom, and hopefully it's a, a, a two-way street. What time frame? Um, so yeah. some of the regulations have some time frame requirements. Um, so we're talking about compliance and, and communication, and one of those things is how soon do you have to notify the other partner that there is a security or a privacy breach incident that is um, reportable. 
uh, mm -hmm. because not everything is reportable. Um, and the standard for that is changing. So, you know, GDPR is now saying you know, within 48, 72 hours. Right. And that's becoming the new standard. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's another little tricky element that, uh, that a lot of people don't realize is in those BAA templates that we have, not only does it say you have to notify us uh, within X number of days. Now, HIPAA says as soon as possible, but no later than 60 days. That's so most people time. think they got 60 days. And that, that's a huge problem. And it, it's, it's becoming a, a very important part of the discussion because 10 years ago, it didn't happen as quick as it happens today. Um, but uh, that is there, and it says as soon as possible. And everybody skips that part and says 60 days. Um, and in and, and, uh, many of the conversations that we're hearing from enforcement says it should be as soon as possible. It should be as soon as possible. And um, so they're really working on that. And I think we're going to start seeing some enforcement action uh, because they waited 60 days. Right. And um, the intent that, of being able to do the reporting is to let people who are in at risk of harm yeah. from that breach um, to be able to be proactive and do something about it. If you don't hear about it for 60 days, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. The damage is already done. Yeah. And, uh, but that's, again, it's about patient care. Right. It's about patient care. It's about notifying your patients. They could be uh, exposed. And so we have that piece, but that piece, there's a lot of trickiness in that of who gets to decide whether it's a reportable breach. So there's another section that says, I'm going to notify you of every potential security incident including pings and all this other stuff. And that section creates a whole new problem because if you're an IT person, I can go pick any firewall at any moment, look at the logs, and they're going to be getting hit. There's going to be scans or pings or something happening where people are trying to get in, but my protections are working. Okay, so we then say, okay, yes, that's a standard piece of the template, but we want to put in there that we both agree that that's happening all the time. I'm going to let you know if there is a serious security incident, even if I determine it doesn't require breach notification. That's very important to have in there, and, and, and when, you know, People are asking what terms should be in a, an agreement. I say, well, which side are you on? Because, you know, which one's easier or which one protects you more? Those are the kinds of things. But what I want is I don't want you to just decide that this doesn't require notification to patients. And then you don't even tell me that you've made that decision. So I want the ability to find out that you had a serious security incident that you determined did not require notification. And I want you to tell me uh, if you think notification needs to be done. And we recommend that because in the contracts, uh, you are required to put in there that the the that you have to under high tech when all that changed, you have to have it in your agreement how many days to notify the upstream. Right. So, yes, the law says if it's not in the agreement, you have 60 days. So imagine that it happens to, with the vendor and the vendor waits 60 days to tell the provider and then the provider waits 60 days to tell the patient. Now you're really in trouble and think if it's two or three vendors down that everybody waits six. So you can't, you can't allow 60 days. Um, so we recommend three to five. And, and that sounds like a very reasonable uh, approach that gets you over a long weekend. Um, and you're not going to have all the details necessarily about what mm -mm. happened in that breach. Um, mm -hmm. But you need to be able to notify so that you can take some steps to uh, figure out what the next steps are. Who's going mm -hmm. to notify the patients if the vendors made a mistake or they've they got hacked. I mean, bad things happen to vendors too. Mm -hmm. um, then do we want the vendor to notify the patients or do you want the healthcare providers to notify the patients? Um, all of that has to be addressed. And that's why we have incident response 
uh, teams and we've got incident response plans and um, we follow that up. That should include misses. your IT vendors. Hello, they should be part of your planning and team and exercises Absolutely. and all that. Right. So in, in your podcast, you've talked about um, working with BIAs and, and what should be in your BIA. And I'm going to put in the show notes on the links to your episodes um, because they're, they're really good information. Um, but, you know, the really key point is, is that we want to make sure that it's there and it's been discussed and that you are updating the documents, not just using a template. A template mm -hmm. helps you get started and that you have to have those documents in place. There's just no if ands or buts cybersecurity insurance is not going to cover you for if you don't have an ima in place no well you know a lot of the uh insurance uh, applications now will specifically ask if you're doing these things and if you say you are and then you aren't then they have the out there you know that you need to not count on your cyber coverage but you know, you need to understand clearly, let me restate that, what your cybersecurity coverage includes. And in some of the agreements we're seeing today, they are requiring not only does the vendor have uh, some sort of a security policy, cybersecurity policy, but uh, larger organizations want them to have a cybersecurity policy just for them. You know, because if I, as an IT vendor, have a one million, three million uh, coverage, which is what we call it down here, but and I've got fifty clients, who's going to get first dibs at that money? And so yeah. you have to worry about not just are they covered, but how much are they covered, and what's the size of the operation. Uh, yeah, and um, cybersecurity insurance has gotten to be a really big topic about what it covers and what it doesn't cover. Um, mm. My understanding is that insurance isn't going to cover fines. Um, that's not what it's for. It's for covering the loss of business while you're trying to recover from from some type of an incident. Well, down here, it's under their malpractice coverage a lot of times, mm. and it does cover fines. Okay. Um, so often it'll do that, but one of the interesting things that we've seen is that, uh, and I can't recall which one of the big data breaches, I don't know if it's Sony or one of the big name data breaches filed their insurance claim to get their coverage. And in the insurance claim, it says nation state attacks aren't, you know, that acts of war aren't covered. And many times you'll see that it, it's yeah. not, it doesn't cover acts of war. Well, they said, look, we have proof that it was another country attacking you. That's an act of war. It's cyber war. It's not covered. Oh, really? And yeah, yeah. So I'm like, you know, and, and, you know, those things take forever, but it's happening. And there have been more than one occasion where the insurance uh, payment gets delayed as you spend years on more money in court just trying to get paid what it is that you uh, thought you were going to get in the first place. Well, that's and, really uh, interesting. And the, the loss of business uh, section as well, uh, there are cases where a company filed their loss of business and they were told, yeah, we cover loss of business, but not for data breaches, not for computer problems. So, you know, that's step one of our incident response planning exercise is what are you covered for so that you know? How do you open a claim? Does your claim, your coverage require you to use specific vendors to respond and those kind of things? And if you don't know that about you, what do you think those vendors are doing? <laughs> You know, uh, so that, that, again, that gets into the vetting that we say, all right, you got the contract and you agree on the contract, but I need to ask some more questions just to make sure that you aren't just signing this. Right. You know, that the lawyer said it was okay, but you know what? The lawyers don't know what's actually happening. I, I think that's true too. Um, too. Mm -hmm. So, when I talk with clients and I ask them about their uh, IMAs or agreements with vendors and they show me this two page document that says, um, I'm going to bill you every month for these services and you're going to pay me within 30 days or I'm going to cancel the service. That's not good enough, is it? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> no, I had somebody hand me a one page BAA and it, it wasn't even their contract. It was just the BAA addendum. And I started laughing. I'm like, seriously, this is, I've never seen one this small <laughs> no, ever. Uh, and you know, I'm like, I, I wouldn't sign that. <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, so Donna, we've talked about um, information manager agreements and why the vendors and the healthcare providers need to have a conversation. They need to work with each other. Mm -hmm. Contract management's a big deal, but we got to do it. Right. And, yeah. and you have to know, for example, uh, you know, we, we know of cases where uh, it, it gets tricky, you know, because the large vendors, they get control of the contract in almost all cases. And uh, the small, you know, doctor's office that they have no control. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, even the big health systems don't have a lot of control in the large vendors. And so when the large vendor, uh, and, and this has been a while, I haven't seen it recently, it's in their contracts. Well, they'll periodically, you know, they'll send out, hey, we've updated our contract and they'll give you this big long list. And people just say, oh, okay, and they file it. And there are cases where they changed what their requirements were in their uh, addendum BAA in those cases, and no one noticed, and they just filed it away. And then when something happens, they're like, no, that's not what our agreement said. Yeah, check that update we did. And we gave you the notice we required. We did all of these things, and you didn't respond. So it, it can get very tricky, and people need to treat them like serious contracts that are clearly defined so that it's protecting patients. That, that's what that is, is a contract that says, how are they going to take responsibility for protecting your patients? It's not paperwork. It's about your patients. And to always take it back to that. It makes it so much easier to make business decisions when you take it back to that. Well, I do think it's very important that once you have that contract defined, you need to then ask them questions and you ask them questions every single year. You do what we call the due diligence and you do it every year. And the reason you do it every year is the person that's in charge of that program this year may get another job next year. And now it's not being done anymore or it's being done differently. So you should always work with them just like you're working with your own folks don't make any assumptions because we know you cannot make assumptions when it comes to patient care uh, that's a great point and and so true that you know the people that you you worked with when you set this up they move and the business has changed and you need to keep on top of that that contract management is not a small task but it's so important well and they get purchased yes or they merge yep. and that's where we really see it happen is the company may be very good at it, and then when they are purchased, that gets tossed aside because the purchasing company doesn't put that much effort in it. The other thing that we've seen recently um, is where the healthcare practice has changed. So the custodian or the, the healthcare provider that signed the contract, um, they moved on, and the vendor didn't update their documents either. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it works on both sides. This is very important legal stuff, protecting uh, your business, your reputation, and uh, your patients because it has an impact on all of it. It sure does. Okay. Um, Donna, in your Help Me With HIPAA podcast, I'm going to put in the show notes some specific episodes that I found really helpful about understanding about BAAs and, and tips about what should be included in your BAA. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to add some additional information uh, for Canadian listeners about what needs to be in your IMAs. Um, you've also got all sorts of resources uh, coming up, including your very famous boot camp. Ooh, yeah, we call it the HIPAA boot camp, <laughs> uh, but it's a three-day intensive, and, and we go through the HIPAA laws, but again, it's the privacy requirements, the security requirements, and the um, enforcement details and those kind of things, breach notification, um, and it's three-day intensive, uh, and we call, I mean, literally, you don't leave our room 
We have breakfast together. We have lunch together for three straight days. And usually I have to buy a drink at least after the first day uh, because uh, it, it is intense. And uh, we have yet to have a course where somebody says, well, I knew all that. It was a waste of my time and money. We've had people that are like, I've been here 20, I've been in this uh, uh, kind of data security, all of this 20 years, and I never uh, dreamed that I would learn as much as I did coming here. So we love it. Uh, and it, you've got a, a, a strong following, a strong tribe that obviously loves your, your boot camps. Where, where is the boot camp, Donna? We hold it down here. Uh, we have uh, always held them in Atlanta, um, near my house in Tucker, Georgia, uh, in the deep south, darling. Uh, <laughs> and so the the spring one is uh, March twenty first, twenty second, twenty. It's the it, it's the twenty something, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday that are all twenties, <laughs> because. You know, at this point, that information is gone, but you can go to thehippabootcamp.com to learn about those dates. At this time, we are in discussions, and we hope by the end of January, we'll be able to announce that we're doing one uh, somewhere on the west coast of the U.S. Um, in uh, the September time frame is what we're looking at. Okay. And, uh, so we're, we're doing two a year. Um, we've tried a lot of different things. We did a virtual one, all those, but we found that this is what really works. Three days twice a year and uh and we do get some fantastic feedback because we do make it very intimate we don't want a massive room full of people uh we want everybody to feel comfortable asking questions and making statements like i had no idea you know or tell me that again or you won't believe what happened there if this happens in an office, hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically, I know from a friend, <laughs> I heard. <laughs> and for those folks that can't join you in Georgia, you've got resources on the uh, Help Me With HIPAA podcast website page, um, yes. the basic compliance officer training, and uh, for both covered entities and business associates. Mm -hmm. And you've got resources on Cardon. Oh, yes. Okay. We're available. We are okay. Um, so I want to thank you for joining me on to the podcast for Practice Management Nuggets. Um, this has been an absolute treat um, to talk with the Southern Bell and uh, <laughs> to learn more about uh, HIPAA and information, ma uh, information manager agreements and BAA entities um, in the U.S. experience that will help to predict what's going to happen to us in Canada so that we can get ahead of that and we can protect our practice and protect our patients' information. Well, I am so thrilled to have had this opportunity, you know, feeling all international and stuff. <laughs> that's right. We're, we've gone global, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. We, uh, uh, I, Southern Bell is not one that I'm normally called. I'm a little bit more of a, uh, yeah, you know, redneck is what they call it down here, I guess. <laughs> great. But no, it's, uh, uh, great to uh, be part of it, and I do. I've been to Canada, and and it's gorgeous in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> it's gorgeous in the winter too. They no, just have to wear an extra coat. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm a good Southerner. We don't do that. Yeah, I'm ready to move south of 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 Atlanta because it's getting. You know, we have a, enough of a winter to remind me I don't like it. Well, everybody has our own our our own um, uh, preferences. Yes, and that is why we get to uh, uh, enjoy each other's company and learn uh, from each other instead of telling each other what to do. Which gets back to if you're uh, trying to convince people to do this, don't just tell them what to do. You know, okay. have a conversation. That's right. what it's about. Absolutely. That relationship's real important. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> I love surrounding myself with practice managers and healthcare providers and vendors who want to start, grow, and improve their practices. I want to help you with more great tips, tools, templates, and training that you can use right away. I search for guest experts who will share their number one tip with you.
Let me know if there's a topic or a guest expert that you want to hear on Practice Management Nuggets for your healthcare practice. Did you hear something on today's podcast that you would like to go back and listen to again? Or maybe you heard something on one of our previous podcasts, but you don't remember which one and you'd like to be able to find it quickly and easily. Well, that's easy to do now. If you heard something on this podcast that you want to revisit, go to practicemanagementnuggets.live forward slash search and enter the keyword in the magic box. You will be brought back to the podcast at the exact spot where we talked about it. This video keyword search tool uses the new Searchy app. If you would like to know more about this, visit informationmanagers.ca likes dash searchy that's s-e-a-r-c-h-i-e if you like this episode please subscribe to this channel and add your honest feedback to the comments below when you leave your review it helps people who like what you like to find this podcast until next time this is Jean eaton your practice management mentor with information managers